Thank you. How are you guys doing? Good morning. The hungry have come to the trough to drink the banquet. Yeah, the yeah, the banqueting table, the heavenly trough banqueting table. Well, looking forward to this morning. We have two sessions, kind of back to back. Want to encourage you to take notes. This is not really a conference style of event. Um, so in, in my desire, I believe God's desire is to plug you into some truth that uh, changes some things in your life and really changing your mindset, changing your, your vantage point, your paradigm, how you see, how you think, how you view God, how, how God or how you position yourself in God in this season specifically is very important. And um, so I want to give you some keys. I really want to encourage you to take notes. If you don't take notes, you're not going to remember half of what I say. You won't even, won't even remember 95% of what I say. So I encourage you to take notes on your iPad, iPhone, Blackberry, Blueberry, whatever you have. Or if you're really living in the ancient days, then yeah, paper. Yeah. <laughs> so... It's crazy what when I used to travel before like the iPad was like a, a big deal I mean I'd have like stacks and stacks of paper and when this thing came out I said God I want one of those actually Sammy had one first and a friend of mine Jeremy Nelson had one and they're like you should get one I'm like no I don't need one I have papers and I always use these papers and uh, so I said one day, fine, you know what, this could be really good for me. So I sowed money into an offering. And almost as a joke, I said to God, I'm going to sow believing for an iPad. I was kind of serious, kind of joking to the Lord. But God hears our jokes. He hears our prayers. He hears our thoughts. You can't hide anything from God, right? You know that, right? So I sowed this offering, believing God for an iPad. And about, about a month later... I'm at a meeting, and this guy, who I barely even know, walks, into, walks up to me in the, the meeting and said, God told me to buy this for you. Here's a brand new iPad. So I was so thankful to the Lord, and so I, now I use this amazing iPad. But then, two years later, I'm in another meeting, like I, tell, I said last night, if you were here last night, and God says to me, sow the iPad into the offering. So I sowed that iPad in the offering, and this whole thing broke out. I told you last night, if you were here, the boat, the gold, the silver, the Harley Davidson, the motorcycles, the cars that were sowed into the offering, and uh, powerful experience of generosity that broke out in our church. And, um, and then about three weeks later, to about a month, not even, maybe even yeah, three weeks, somebody walked up to me in a meeting and said, God told us to give this to you. Here's a brand new iPad 4. So I was like, thank God for the upgrade. See, what happens when you're faithful, though, when you, when you do what God wants you to do, you reap the rewards that God's promised to you and for you. But so much, so much of us, or so many of us, don't access or reap the rewards that God's promised us because we don't listen to God. We don't, we don't listen to God. I was in a meeting one time, and God said, uh, said to me, um, uh, I want you to sow this amount into the offering. It made no sense. It was totally outside of our grid. We were in great need, and, and we did it. And I think at that point, at that time in our life, uh, you know, it wasn't even that big of an offering per se, but for us, it was massive. And I think it was maybe, uh, I think it was like $1,800 in one offering. Now, that's big for some people, and the, at that time, it was massive for us, massive. And, uh, and we did that by faith, and one week later, somebody from B.C., a friend of mine, did not know anything, wrote me a check personally for $1,856. like $56. said, we want to sew it into you, not your ministry, but sew it into you personally. Like about a week later. Like how many know that's, not, that's God? See, when you listen to God, I can tell you story after story about when we stepped out in faith financially and God did something miraculous and it was incredible. And so, I don't know why I'm telling you that. Oh, because the iPad. Thank God for the iPad. So now I have this amazing iPad. My iPad's better than Sammy's iPad. I have the iPad 4. Oh, does he? Someone gave him an iPad, didn't he? Didn't they? 
Oh, I heard that. Okay, I heard that. I did hear that. Okay. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I think I heard that story, actually. That's amazing. Um, well, this morning I want to talk about the golden secret. Everyone say the golden secret. The golden secret. And I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you the golden secret today. Helping you understand what really honors God. Because this is absolutely important. I have a whole teaching, four discs, I think it is back there, called Experiencing Divine Order. It's all about alignment, coming into alignment, coming into divine alignment. I have some really strong prophetic messages on there, one of which came out of two really powerful encounters that I had. It's called the Yada of God, I think. I forget what it's called, but it's experiencing divine order and understanding what we need to allow into our life to bring us into order, bring our life into order. Where there's, not, where there's no order, there's no health. Order brings health. And when you're healthy, you're mature. Order always brings health. You know that we're in the season, we just, this month, went into the, the Hebrew New Year, 5774. You know, and in, in the, the Hebrew culture, every decade has a theme. And we've been in the decade of 70, which is the theme of the I, the ion, the, the, the letter in the Hebrew, the ion. It's the, this, this, the decade of the I, the seeing, the seeing I. But now we've moved into the, the, the year, it's year number four, 74, which is the, 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 the Dalit, the word Dalit, the, the letter Dalit in the, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew letter. Every Hebrew letter has a, a picture attached to it that describes something. The Hebrew language is very, very um, visual. You know, it's always, the Hebrew language is always painting a picture, which is why Jesus spoke in parables. He was always painting pictures for his people, for, for his disciples, and for those that, the masses that were listening to his teaching. He was always painting a picture. And the Hebrew language is like that. It paints a picture. And, and this is the year of the door. Number four, uh, prophetically, and the, the letter, the Dalit, is the year of the door, the new, the new door, the open door, leaving the old door of confusion and disorder and coming into a new door of opportunity, health, and order. And so we are in a good season. I mean, on the Hebrew calendar, 5774, we're in a good season as a body of Christ. And when we move from confusion and disorder, we move from that place to move into a place of healthy order and maturity. And we need to understand what season we're in so we can move into the next season with strength. But I want to turn your attention to Psalm 16, verse 8. Psalm 16, verse 8. I want to read this to you. And... Years ago, I had a dream, and I woke up in my, and often my dream life is very active. My dream life is very active, but also my, I don't even call it dreaming. Josh experienced it last night, <laughs> where I, I actually will get up, and you don't, you don't know if I'm awake or if I'm asleep. My eyes will be completely open, and I'll be looking at you, and I'll be prophesying or saying something. It happens to my wife all the time. Like I woke up one time, and I, I don't remember this obviously, and my wife tells me the next morning, I woke up one time and I was telling her every vitamin she was missing in her body and why, why there was deficiency. And I was telling her this vitamin's missing, this vitamin's missing. I have this incredible, incredible dreams and experiences. And she doesn't always know, but she's learned while I'm in this state to converse with me. So she can have full-on conversations with me and get revelation from God through me by talking to me and asking me questions when I'm in this state. I don't even have any recollection of any of it. So I'll be in this experience talking and saying what I see. She's like, what do you mean? And, and, and then she'll, I'll describe it to her. So when she wakes up, she remembers and now is able to understand what's going on in the spirit. So this happens all of the time. Last night I got up <laughs> twice and uh, what did I what did I say to you? What did I, what did I what was the one thing that I said to you? You you kept repeating over and over like, uh, don't go backwards, go forwards. Like don't go backwards, go forwards. And you kept like saying that over and over again. And I was like, 
woke up and I'm like, I'm feeling like convicted. I'm like, oh my gosh, like what is going on right now? Like, and then another time you got up, I don't, I totally forget what you were saying, but you were like standing right up and then you like. Standing over your bed. Yeah, you were standing over your bed, eyes open, like staring at me, talking and talking. And I'm like, okay, I know you're obviously not awake. See, I don't remember any of this stuff, but this is, to give you an example, this is what I, my wife lives with, okay? It's not always pleasant. It's not always pleasant, right? Um, but I'm very, I, and I don't, even when I get up in the state, during the state, I don't even realize, like, that I can't distinguish between reality and not reality. That's how real it is. It's an open vision often. So I can't tell you if it's real or not real. And so that's how intense it is. And so just saying all of that, I, uh, years ago, I, I woke up saying this scripture out loud, Psalm 16, 8. I was reciting it. I woke, actually woke up to myself saying it. Okay? And it's this Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now, like when you wake up repeating a scripture that not even, that, that wasn't even in my vocabulary. Like, you get understand this? Like I, I was not meditating on this verse. It was just, it was somewhere in my spirit, man. This is what happens sometimes. If you study the word, you read the word, you don't realize where it stays. It stays somewhere in your spirit. It's held up in your spirit. It's, it's bound up. It's like, I believe our spirit is like an envelope. And God deposits truth in our envelope, and he seals it, and he opens it up at the appointed time. And so sometimes, you know, all of a sudden we'll say things we don't even know how we knew them. We don't even ha know how we know. We don't even know, you know, it's like Job says, you know, uh, you know some God will speak in one way or another in a dream or in a vision in the night while slumbering on their beds. Then he seals their instruction. I believe that God can deposit in you something in the night season and put it in the envelope of your spirit and seal it up and so that one day, all of a sudden, you, you realize something that you never even knew you knew, but you knew. It's like what they call a deja vu. Everybody ever heard that term before? A de I believe deja vus, okay? I don't believe it's a new age thing. I believe a deja vu actually is you becoming aware of something that's already taken place in a dream that God put in the envelope of your spirit, and all of a sudden now you're in that atmosphere. It's opened up to you. You're like, oh my gosh, I was here. I, I, I know it's going to happen. I was talking to you. I have a deja vu. God wants to get your attention. So now all of a sudden you're aware of something that was already on the inside of you. You following me? Okay? So when this kind of stuff happens, pay attention. So I wake up and I'm reciting a scripture I didn't even know that I knew. You, you follow what I'm saying? And so I'm saying this scripture over and over again. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And I went on this journey after that day of intense meditation on this scripture, chewing on this scripture. And there are times where I'll take a whole eight-hour day just to meditate and chew on a scripture. Why? Because I want to step into the reality of it. There's, it's one thing to read the word, okay? You can read all the, wor the words you want, and I won't do jack squat for you. Okay? You can read. Seriously, you can be a non-believer and read the word all you want, and I won't do anything for you. Until the Holy Spirit breathes on it, okay? The Holy Spirit is the one who literally extracts the gold from the word for you. So you understand it. He's the one that helps you really discern spiritual things. Okay? That's his, per that's his job description. is to guide us into all truth. To teach us. To counsel us. To illuminate the word. To show us the beauty and the depth of the word. It's very important we get that. The Holy Spirit's job, His focus is to help us. So we can read the Word all we want, and we can study the Word all we want, and attain more knowledge, but there's something totally different about stepping into the reality of the Word. And we do that through meditation, through meditation, which becomes an open door for us to experience the manifestation of the Word. It's always been Jesus' desire that you become the manifestation of the Word just like Him. He was John 1, the Word made flesh. 
God wants to make the Word flesh in your life. What does that mean? He wants the Word to become reality to you in your experience, where you step into the experience of the Word. Are you with me? He doesn't want you just to know about the Word so that you feel more spiritual, makes you more smart. You can teach it, talk to the, the best of the best, the most intellectual individual in the world, and you, you, you know, you're known as a great theologian. That's all good. But if that theology has not transformed your life, it's not good. You become like every other religious people person that Jesus warned us against. You have this form, but you have no, you're not living the word. You're not living the word out. James 1.22 is very clear. The greatest deception is not false prophets, not false teachers. It's being a hearer of the word only. The Bible says in James 1.22, if you're a hearer only, you're deceiving yourself. If you're a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, in other words, you're not experiencing living out the word, stepping into the word, you're actually in a really great deception. Because you think somewhere it's okay just to hear it, but not actually live it out. So to, to, meditate, to meditate on the word is to create, I believe, an open door to step into the manifestation of the word where the Word becomes flesh to your life. You with me? I was driving my car one time to a meeting. I was teaching a bunch of leaders, and God spoke to me, said, Sean, people always say that the root systems of our faith is the Bible, the Word. He said, Sean, that's not true. He said the root systems of our faith and the roots of our faith is the Bible applied. It's the Bible applied. It's the, the truth of the Word applied to your life. That's what grows your roots deep into the ground and make you strong, makes you strong. Because now you're living out the manifestation of the Word. And when you live out the manifestation of the Word, your roots grow deep so that when storms come, you can't be uprooted. But if you keep it all up here, you'll be easily uprooted. Easily. And your theology will always be changing. You'll never know what you believe. You'll be tossed to and fro, back and forth, by every wave of doctrine because it's up here. But once it, it goes from here to here and you apply it to your life, your roots grab a hold of something. And so that when storms come, you're strong. You're strong. Nothing moves you. So to set the Lord always before us so that we cannot be moved, what does that mean? What does that really mean to set the Lord? Now, before I go into this, this psalm specifically is called, and I want, to, I want you to write this down if you can, is called a Michtam of David. M-I-C-H-T-A-M. It's called the Michtam of David. And there are a few of these. And this word in the Hebrew comes from the word katam. Everyone say katam. And it means to be stained. Something that's engraved or to cut into. That's what it means. To be stained, or it means to cut into or engrave. And what this means is that what is about to be spoken. So this psalm is in introduced as a Mishtam of David. And what that means is that what's about to be spoken is worthy of being engraved into our very minds. It's worthy of being chiseled in stone. That's how important it is. In other words, that this psalm is so important that it's worthy of being engraved in a stone, and it's the stone of your heart. There's something that is more important about this psalm than other psalms. Some theologians call this psalm the golden psalm. That's why I call it the golden secret. They call it the golden psalm. There's something gold about this psalm that we need to look at. You with me? I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So what does it mean to set Jehovah, who is the Lord, always before us? What it means is this. Take some notes. We must look to him with every affection in our hearts and minds and put Him as the central focus of our life. 
To set God before us is nothing else than to keep all of our senses bound and captivated by Him. So for eight hours one day, I took this psalm and I just meditated on it. I, read, I just, over and over again, I just repeated it over and over again to myself. And I began, all of a sudden, I begin to see myself taking my finances, taking my family, taking my, our ministry, taking everything that we do in life, everything, our stuff, our household, our vehicles, our, our everything, and just saying, God, I, I put that all before you. I set you in the central focus of my affection above all of this stuff. Every issue, every challenge that we're facing, I take it and I put it, to, I put it in front of you. That's what it looks like to set him before us. To put him as our focus. It means to continually, constantly depend upon the assistance of God. A constantly, constantly depending. It means to intently fix our focus upon the providence of God. To be fully persuaded that even when any difficulty or distress would come before us or come against us, we would trust that He will take care of us. That's what it means to set Him before us. It means to make Him first. Psalm 16, 1 to 2, the first part of this chapter says this, preserve, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. He's kind of preparing us to truly understand what it looks like to set him before us because the result of setting him before us in every area of life is that we will be solid. We will be stable. We will be cemented in Im and unmovable. But the first part of this verse or chapter gives us some keys. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. To set him before us is to realize that our works are of nothing. Our works are really of no avail for us to be approved of God or to really set us on the right track. It's acknowledging that in Him is all goodness. In Him is everything good. Psalm 16, verse 5 to 6 says, O Lord, You are my portion of my inheritance and my cup. You have maintained my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. To understand that He is everything. He is our inheritance. To understand that truth is to set Him before us in every area of our life. So that when your money is lost, stock market crashes, bad things happen to your material possessions, your car breaks down, you realize that your inheritance and your trust in Him, not only as Jehovah Jireh, the provider, but El Shaddai, the God of more than enough, that your trust in that truth, that reality, stands strong in the face of when everything crashes around you. That's what it looks like to put Him and set Him before us in every area. Let's read out of Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9. Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9 says this, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with Him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's ways of making us right with Himself depends on faith. To truly regard everything else as worthless in comparison to what I gain in Christ is to set Him always before us. To set Him at our right hand. Because we are at His right hand, we will not be moved. You with me? You know, I... I Years ago, I had this, this vision during the Day of Atonement. 
of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ was wearing these, these keys around her neck, like a, a necklace, and had all these keys. And I, God began to speak to me about the condition about the, of the body of Christ. And I'm speaking generally here. Of the, how most of us, you know, we talk about our new nature. We talk about how we've been set free, born again. We're a new creation. Talk about how we, we've been severed from our old ways, our old self. Like we talked about last night, we've been spiritually circumcised. We talk about it. And we wear the uniform, but we don't act. We don't act the way we're supposed to. It's like a cop. A cop, you know, wearing the uniform, being in the midst of a crime, and just standing watching. Everyone knows they're a cop. They're wearing the uniform. They're wearing the keys. They're wearing the authority. The uniform symbolizes the authority that they have to act. The badge they're wearing symbolizes the authority they have to act. But they just watch the crime. They don't do anything. That's kind of like what happens in the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We have the authority. But a lot of us are just comfortable with wearing the authority, not acting in the authority. So how do we actually act in the authority? Well, every day we have to be conscious of putting on our new nature. And it's a mindset. Because we already are set free. We already are no longer slaves of sin. Sin already has no longer any dominion or mastery over us. So every day we have to renew our minds into that truth and put on our nature by faith and say, Jesus, today I am a new man. Reminding ourselves that we are a new creation. We have the mind of Christ. Colossians 3 verse 9 to 10. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. Every day, we're learning to know who He is, what He's like, and every day we're being conformed more into the image and likeness of the Son in our actions. You can be righteous and not act righteously. That's just the reality of the gospel. I mean, he's made you righteous. But it's in the knowledge and revelation of that righteousness that we act righteously. So people say, oh, you can't preach grace. Oh, that's just stupid. <laughs> that's the gospel. Well, people take it out of context and it's a license to sin. No, understanding grace is a license to be righteous. But it's a wrong understanding of grace that produces the opposite. It's a right understanding of grace that produces the right experience and right way of living. Are you with me? So every day we have to put on our new nature, put Him as our focus, to set Him always before us. Focus all of our affections, all of our desires towards Him every day. Putting our husbands, our wives, our children always before God, our financial situation, our businesses. I mean, how many of us do that? We know some of us, we want to separate the details of our life from God. So we do our church. This is what God wants to get out of the church. I think God wants to give the church a spiritual lobotomy. Or as Rodney Howard Brown put it, an enema. Because the church is, is, is jammed up right now. There's like a, a spiritual constipation in the body of Christ. God needs to do a flush. And really a lot of it is bad theology. It is bad theology. It's works driven theology. That produces this, this bitterness towards God. In people that are immature. Well I don't want to go to church because I got to do, 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 do. No, God doesn't like doo-doo. He doesn't want your doo-doo. It stinks. Jesus did one thing. He died to take care of all your doo-doo so you could live free. And it's by what His doing that we have been made righteous. By His work that we've been made righteous and set free. And a lot of us, were still striving to get God's approval, and God's just like, stop, st- stop it. Stop it. Live the kingdom life I've called you to live by understanding that you are free. 
get out of this rapture mentality that one day you're, you're going to be raptured, and, and which is not even anywhere in Scripture, first of all. Focus on the now kingdom that's in you, the kingdom within. Live victoriously now. Don't just wait one day when all things are going to get better. Because this right now is practice. This right now is an opportunity, John 10 verse 10, to live the abundant life you're called to live, which is a promise of God. It's a super abundant life. That word for abundance, it says in John 10, 10, the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. But, the, but Jesus came to give life and life abundant. That word in the, in the literal Greek means super abundance. An overflowing abundance. A measure that will overwhelm you. That's what it means. That's God's heart for you now. But a lot of us are waiting for the one day. And I'm telling you, one of the, I, one of the greatest ways that we learn to access that abundance is learning how to involve Him in every detail of our lives. We want to separate. Well, I have my God time. I go to church. I'm spiritual. Then I work my job. And I'm a jerk. I work my job, and, I, and I, I have no character. I'm late. I don't care about, you know, whatever. I hate my job. And, and it's like we have this attitude, and, and so then we go to church. Jesus! And we go home. On the way home with our, in our vans, our cars, our whatever, we fight with our wives. We fight with our husbands. We feel guilty. We enter that cycle of, <laughs> of stuff that takes place. Go back to church. It's like, Jesus! And it's like we don't have really much conversation with God during the week. You know, my, my wife's amazing, and my wife involves God in every decision, her shopping experiences. We've had people come up to us during while we're shopping that we don't even know and say, I don't know why, but here's somebody to buy some clothes. Because my wife prays when she goes shopping. People say, well, you're being super spiritual. Oh, Amen. I love being super spiritual. I'd rather be super spiritual than depressed and unsuper spiritual. I'd rather be over spiritual than under spiritual. Sorry. I'd rather err on that side of the coin and get more wins than err on the other side and be depressed, boring, bored, and dull, and religious. And to say God's only a God of the Sunday morning. My wife prays for parking spaces. We, we pray for favor in every area, and we involve God in the details of our life. You know why? Because he delights in the details. God is a really detailed individual. Look at the design of the temple, the old covenant temple. I mean, there, I mean, God had his hand on everything. He was a control freak. He was a, he was a, um, he was a micromanager. I mean, he, he was managing every detail. He's like, I want this to be purple. I want this to be blue. I want it to look this way. I want it to be this long. I want it to have the cherubim on this side, the cherubim on this side, gold this, gold that. I mean, he was very detailed. When God gave the blueprint to, to David and then Solomon built the temple, I mean, you know that Solomon's, you know how much it was worth? We, got, we want to get out of this poverty mentality in Canada. You know how much, there's been studies that have been done you know how much Solomon's church would have been worth today in today's con economy? How much Solomon's temple that God designed, that God wanted, okay? Remember this. God wanted it this way. You know how much it would have been worth in today's culture? Guess what? $54 billion. So imagine a $54 billion church. You'd rattle some religious feathers. The world is suffering poverty. That's what Judas did, didn't he? Remember... The, the perfume, the costly oil perfume that was poured out on Jesus' feet, who was the one that responded and acted like he was compassionate towards the impoverished? Who was it? Judas, the very one that also betrayed Jesus for money. Funny, eh? It sounded like he had this revelation of money and providing for the poor and all this stuff and this desire, but yet a whole year's worth of wages was poured out in one moment. Jesus likes that. $54 billion church. I mean, imagine that. What would that look like today? I mean, seriously, imagine that. I mean, there's a building, there's a, uh, a training, 
uh, I don't know what it's called exactly, but right near our church uh, where they're going to actually train spies from around the world. It's a $3 billion project. It's massive. And it's, uh, you know, it's like one of those secret service type Canadian version uh, deals. And, uh, but it's this massive, beautiful building. But just imagine what it would look like. There's a church out in Singapore that built a $1 billion church facility. And guess what? It was paid for cash. It's actually the, the, one of the number one tourist attractions and faci- arts facilities in all of Singapore. And a church raised $500 million of that money. And they actually rented out, I think, for like a dollar a month or something. I mean, it's crazy. I don't know what the thing is, but they, it, they, they're, they're connected with the, a business that's part of the church as well. And they bought this facility. They built it, paid for it cash, $1 billion facility. We need to get a revelation of how God is interested in the details. He's interested in all these things. He wants us to advance. He wants us to move forward. And, but I think that a lot of us, we sell ourselves short because we think God doesn't care. And so we actually rob ourselves of blessing and prosperity in areas of light because we think God doesn't care. God doesn't care what kind of car I have. God doesn't care what kind of you know, a house I have. God doesn't care what he does. I want to show you Psalms 37 verse 23. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. The steps of the godly aren't just when you come on Sunday morning and only when you make big, big decisions. The steps of the godly, it's everyday steps. Galatians says keep in step with the Spirit. It's every day. Every day he's involved. He wants to be involved in every part, every detail, every decision of your life. We, um, 2011, I, God began to speak to me, and maybe some of you have heard my testimony of the bees. Anyone here heard my testimony of the bees? No, okay, well, I won't go through all of it, but you can get it. It's all actually on here, and spiritual transition. It's a, it's a, um, it's a C, uh, four CD set of the transition that we are in as individuals and the body of Christ, and it's launching, learning how to launch into God's purposes in our life, and it's four CDs. Um, one is uh, Keys for Stability, learning how to be stable in the midst of change and transition. Number two is our second greatest mentor. You know, our second greatest mentor is our season. Not an individual. It's the season that God's put us in. The season that we're in mentors us. It trains us. It challenges us. It grows us. Number three is his spiritual design for your life. His design for your life. How he wants to move with you, through you, in you. And number four is a new season, a new era, which I talk about um, the bees on and my encounter with the honeybees. And in, two, in May of 2011, I want to give this. Who wants this? I want to give this to somebody. Who's in like a transition old time right now of change? You are? Okay, I'll give it to you. The pastors are saying you are, so here, I'll walk over and give it to you. Yeah, bless you. 2011, though, I had this, this word, powerful word from God, and, and I didn't even know what it meant. And I was in a prayer meeting, and I had this open vision of this giant honeybee. And God said to me, you're about to enter the season of the bees, and you're going to see signs to confirm this. I was like, what's the season of the bee, you know? And uh, I can't share everything right now, but I uh, told my wife, I didn't say anything in the meeting. I said, Michelle, we're about to enter the season of the bee. I don't know what this means, but we're going to see signs. You watch, we're going to see signs of, of this that's going to follow us in this next season. And, uh, and about a week later, I was at a wedding, and one of, my, one of my board members is a bug scientist. It's funny, like, who's a bug scientist? I don't know any bugs. He's on my board. A bug scientist. And uh, he's actually, he's like a really well-known, like internationally known bug scientist, like, received in all these different awards and um and he told and i asked him, i said what i said i don't know this is weird but god told me we're entering the season of the bees i said what's with this bee is there anything prophetic that you know because you're a bug scientist you study bugs he said actually you know all around the world right now bees are going missing whole bee farms are shutting down and this is when it started to get become really a big deal and and uh you know uh, it's a, it's a it's an epidemic really 
and I was like, interesting. I didn't really look into it anymore. And the end of May, I was, uh, before I went into prayer, I received an email from this bug scientist, and he sent me an email saying, Sean, I was just at one of these, uh, you know, uh, these expos with a bunch of bug scientists. We were all discussing how there's been a rapid increase all of a sudden of bees again in this last season. And um, I began to think about that. I'm like, interesting. And I hadn't seen any bees that year. I went out on my porch after that email, and I started praying, God, give me this understanding. What's this whole thing about the bee? And all of a sudden, this bee comes around my head, starts flying around my head. Now, you're like, okay, what the heck? It's a coincidence. No, there's no coincidences in, in God. And there's no coincidences in, the king, in kingdom life, just so you know. God orders every step. He delights in, he delights in every detail of your life. He, he, he actually situates and designs every element of your life. It all happens for a reason. So I, I began to have this conversation with this bee, and I didn't get any revelation. The bee didn't talk back to me. So I, I just asked God, I'd be like, God, you've got to give me another sign. And so now, and I knew 2011 was very significant on many different levels. And I can't go, through, like I said, through everything. But I was in Alberta on June 11th, 2011, speaking at a conference. And my wife calls me from Ottawa saying I need to talk, or texted me saying I need to talk to you right now. And uh, she says, you'll never believe what just happened. So the cops just showed up at our doorstep and said, ma'am, you have over 2,000 honeybees on your lawn in a giant ball. Be, be aware. Be careful. Don't go near it. It wasn't a beehive. It was a ball of bees. And uh, I was like, you're kidding me. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Now I went to a whole new level. So it began this whole journey, and you can hear a little bit about it, and I can tell you some of the craziest signs that took place uh, after that season, in that season, just while God began to speak to me about the transition. It was all about new leadership. It was all about transition and new leadership and the, this thing that God was doing in the body because what happened was I did a study on it, and, and when a beehive gets too full, a colony gets too full, they appoint a new leader, and they tra a portion of the beehive transitions out of the colony, with the new leader to a transitional location for a few days as they send out scouts to find their new building, their new beehive. And so they happened to stop on my property uh, in that transition time, and God began to speak to me about the transition in the body of Christ, the whole thing. Anyways, so God made the bee a sign for me in that season. I mean, it was crazy. For the next year and a half, it was a sign for me. I mean, I'll tell you some of the craziest, weird stories. So now, and I'm telling you this, all this, all, all this, all this, all this for a reason, because I want to show you how God is involved in every detail of our lives. And so, you know, we were about to have our third child, and uh, you know, when you have a third child, you have to buy a new vehicle. And so we were praying, God saying, what, what vehicle do you want us to buy? You know, you delight yourself in every detail of our lives. God, we're setting you before us. You know, we're not going to be moved by this season because we need to move into a season of increase. We're having a third child. We need things to, to shift. You delight in every detail of our lives. So what vehicle should we buy? And so we were praying about what vehicle we should buy. And we were looking at these two different vehicles. And, and we weren't really feeling it. And we were saying, God, there's only three options. Really, give us, give us uh, the, you know, what van. Give us a sign of what van we should buy. Give us a sign of what van we should buy. So I went to this dealer with my daughter, Promise, my oldest daughter. And we are at this dealer, and this guy was supposed to show us this one van. He didn't show us this van. He showed us a different van, totally different van. And I said, God, give us a sign. And my, my wife wasn't with me. And so we're in this dealer, and he says, listen, why don't you bring this van home? It's brand new. It's 26 kilometers on it. It's brand new. It just hasn't even, maybe like it's went to the, off the lot one time. 26 kilometers on it, brand new, okay? Think about this, it's brand new. So take this home to your wife for a day and show her. Let her, let us know what you think. Let her, let us know what she thinks. So they give me the keys. They go out to the van. They open up the trunk of the van, and there's a beehive in the van, and all these bees come out of the van. And then they're like, get the, get the raid! And they're all freaking out, and they're all running out with the raid because like, there's children around and stuff, and, and there's bees. And I'm like thinking to myself, oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? 26 kilometers, brand new. There's a beehive in the trunk of the van. Are you hearing this? You know why? God delights in every detail of our lives. We ended up buying that van. I can tell you story after story. And you see, this is what happens when you learn... To set him always before you in every season, every situation of life. Then you begin to see what he really is doing. 
And when you begin to see what he really is doing, guess what? It grounds you. It cements you. So you will not be moved when storms come your way. You with me? Are you happy? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. I want to close with two things here, then we're going to take a break. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. One of the, one of the things that I want us to think about in this process of setting him before us comes from an experience that I had, and I share more about it in my Experiencing Divine Order series back there. And I was, it was Independence Day. Very interesting. It was Independence Day a few years ago. And I, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and my wife told me this all the next morning. So basically, she just prophesied my prophetic word to me because I wasn't even aware I was doing it, like I said earlier. And I'm scrounging around my bed, and I'm rustling around my bed, and she doesn't know what's going on. And she's like, what, what are you doing? And I'm, once again, I'm asleep. Like, what are you doing? And I said, we need to focus on this. We need to focus on this. I said it three times. We need to focus on this. She's like, focus on what? I said, the yada. The yada, the yada, becoming one with God. And the next day she told me that. Now this was an Independence Day. The next day she told me that. And I went on this whole new journey and God gave me this whole revelation in that season of what, what he was saying to the body in the context even of what I'm talking to you about today. This golden secret of setting him before us, before us in every area of life. The knowledge that he is at our right hand. And because of that, we will not be moved. That word yada is a Hebrew word, okay? Found in many different scriptures. Genesis 4 verse 1, speaking of how it says, Adam knew his wife Eve and bore a son named Cain. That word for new, speaking of specifically in that context, sexual intimacy, produced fruit, produced Cain. That word for new is the yada in the Hebrew. It's something that is experienced to produce fruitfulness, okay? In many other scriptures, it also means to experience something by sight. To visibly experience an element of God, a component of God's nature. Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him. The word for acknowledge is yada Him. In all of your ways, set him before you as your central focus so you can experience him by sight, not just knowledge, but experience him by sight. And if you learn to put him as the central focus of your experience in all of the journeys and ways of your life, you'll always walk straight. That's what it means. And God was saying to us, focus on this. Focus on setting him before you. Focus on experiencing Him in intimate relationship. Focus on putting Him as priority and focus in our lives. We need to focus on the yada. In all of our ways, in all of our journeys of life, we acknowledge, we yada Him. Are you following me? So we set God before us by positioning ourselves to experience him in every journey of life. How do we experience him? By learning how to see what he's doing. We got to learn how to see what he's doing in every season of life. God is doing something specifically incredible, specific in, your, in this season right now, in your life. Something incredible. But if you don't see it, you'll forfeit your season. And you'll end up walking around in circles like the Israelites did for 40 years. If you don't learn to see what he's doing. In your life. Psalms 23 verse 1. We know the scripture. says the Lord is my what? Shepherd. I shall not lack. Or want. The Lord is Jehovah. He is the one who I set before me. In every component of my life. The Lord is Jehovah. He's Jehovah Rohi. He's my shepherd. What does it mean to be Lord? And what does it mean to be shepherd? The Lord speaks of his deity. The Lord speaks of his divinity. And the shepherd speaks of his humanity. His connection to humanity. Because you see, David was a shepherd. David grew and matured as a son of God, as a shepherd boy, playing his, his instrument, worshiping God with all the sheep. 
He learned the heart of a shepherd because he was a shepherd. So he could say, the Lord is my shepherd. Because I know how I cared for my sheep. How much more does God, my Father, my Lord, Jehovah, care for me as his sheep? The Lord is my shepherd. I trust in him in every area of my life. The shepherd took care of every element of the sheep. Because the sheep are the dumbest animals on the face of the planet. And yet we're equated... We're, we're related to sheep in the Bible. What, what it's really all about is just it's saying, you know what? We have to 100% rely on God who is our shepherd for everything. For everything. So the Lord is my shepherd. I can rely on him for everything. That revelation right there, in that revelation, we then set the Lord always before us. Trusting that he is our source, our substance for life. And because of that, we shall not lack. I had a dream uh, a few months ago. We, we did this series, six verses in six weeks on Psalm 23, where we broke it down. Powerful. One of the most powerful series that we did all year. And, uh, and during that series, I had this dream where I was on the front of the stage of my stage of my church, and I was confronting lack in the house. Lack over people's finances, over their health, over their relationships, over every area of life, and I was confronting it aggressively. And in the dream, there was a woman sitting to my left, and her name was Sun. Now, in the natural, okay, the wife of one of the guys on our board, his name, her name is Sun. She's a Korean. And in the natural, she sits on my left when I'm preaching every morning. And in my dream, she was sitting on my left in my dream, standing there as I was addressing lack. And I, for some reason, noticed her. And I was noticing her. Now, the left, scripturally, I'm giving you a little bit of a Dream Interpretation 101 right now. If you want to learn more about Dream Interpretation, get my 201 school. I have a whole lesson on learning your dream language, understanding and interpreting your dreams. I have a whole interpretation guide for you. That's in the 201 course that I have on the table there. It's a six-week a six week or a six-session course. You can get it on DVD, CD, and a manual. And uh, I was in this dream, and the left speaks of, in Scripture, of weakness. The right is strength. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be moved. You with me? Okay? The right speaks of strength in the Bible, scripturally, symbolically. The left speaks of weakness. And I noticed, son, in the midst of my weakness, as I was confronting lack. And God began to speak to me. You don't deny, faith is not denying reality. Faith is confronting reality while acknowledging that the sun is right there in the midst of your weakness and the issue. The sun, Jesus Christ. It was a play on words. Her name is sun, but the sun, Jesus Christ, stands in the midst, in the midst of our weakness as we confront the spirit of lack in our lives. We can't forget to acknowledge the Son who stands in the midst of our weakness while we confront the lack in our lives. But we only do that by understanding that He is Lord and He is Shepherd and by setting Him always before us. And if we do that, we will not be moved. Is that okay? Okay.